So I'm going to try to give a brief introduction to my farm and then a short, about a short uh, description about our project. And then I'll try to go into a little more about pasture layers, just like an overview of some of the problems and the difficulties. But really, feel free to stop me and questions. So we're, we're about eight hours north of here. We're in um, northern Michigan, so way up here. Um, I'm sure, like right now, we've got snow on the ground. We've got frost every night. Se seems like a different world down here, honestly. Um, so we probably deal with a, f a little different, um, uh, some different uh, issues than you guys, but I'm sure a lot of it is transferable. Um, so we are a uh, four season farm. We're primarily a vegetable farm, but we, we do proteins on the side. Well, we have 80 acres of fields, woods and pastures. So it's certified organic, the land is, and our produce is, but we do not certify our proteins, uh, mostly because we don't have a really good source for organic protein, for organic grains. And um, so, yeah, it's just a, it's, yeah. Um, so about 10 acres of uh, vegetables in production. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we do about 1,000 layers in the summer on pasture, about 700 in the winter. Um, yeah, meat, birds, pigs. Um, yeah. So this, so this, the grant started as, and so we've raised, I, I lived in New Hampshire for a couple of years. We did about, a th well, same thing, about 1,000 birds on pasture there and two big flocks, like big giant um, movable pastures. We, we circle them with these electric nets. And yeah, here's just like pictures. And we put these, uh, yeah, these are basically on wheels. We, uh, they're, they're movable roosts, movable nest boxes, and their feeders and waters are all sort of like connected. Um, and we, we move them as they need it. So like they're always on fresh grass. Um, typically, we'll, it depend on the time of year and what we're trying to do. But typically, we'll move the nets once or twice a week, and we'll move the actual um, houses either every day or every other day. We'll attach to our tractor or to a truck or whatever and just sort of bump them forward. Um, but we had never had any real problems in the summer. They, they like, well, for us, they like, they like pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, I would say on average, I would say the, for a, like a, a young flock on average, we get about 85% production. Um, however, because we have a lot more demand in the summer, um, we try to ha we have some older birds mixed in with the newer ones, and so that that brings down our our average lay in the summer because some of them are older. But it works out economically for us because we want as many birds as possible in the summer, and we have to lower that in the winter because we just have less demand. Um, so I would say on average we're around 80% in the summer. That's average like 75% are like sold, like you know there's going to be some like house eggs we call them. Um, but so 2014, we had, and it just sometime midsummer, the production just started dropping like crazy, and we couldn't figure out why. Or I couldn't figure out why. Um, at some point, someone was like, "Oh, divide your flock." We had about 350 layers at that point, and one and one uh, uh, movable coop. And someone said to, to divide the crop, divide the, the the flock. So we did, and toward the you know it started coming back up again, like production. It was never great, but it came back up again. And so that winter, I was just trying to figure out why. I, so I thought, oh, maybe we need, you know, just have smaller, smaller flocks. Um, so that, that year, we applied for this grant. Um, the next, so we applied for it in 2015, but the grant didn't start till 2016. So 2015, we had 500 birds in pasture, and we had two flocks, so about 250 birds each. And just like, like it had always been, everything was fine. You know, we had good, light, good ray light, lay rate. Um, but then the SARE project started in 2016. And so we had three flocks. Um, we had a 450, a 250, and a 100, um, yeah, 100 bird flock. Um, the idea was, yeah, just to, just to test the, the production. And again, it started out, all, everything was the same, no problem. Until sometime in mid, mid to late June, it started to be, it was a really hot summer for us, which fortunately for the project, because that was the issue, unfortunately for us, our production started dropping like crazy with the, two, the same thing. Um, so it, went, it dropped, dropped down to nearly 60%. Our 100-layer 100 100 flock didn't drop. Like the smaller flock stayed, stayed laying pretty well, actually above 80%. Um, and it was like that most of the summer, but it was a really hot summer. So the answer for us was like, yeah, the smaller flock lays better. But the question is why? Because it's not simply like 100 birds is the answer. Um, obviously, people have lots of birds, and we had gone for years with much more birds. So that winter, I spent you know, a lot of time just looking around, trying to understand like why. And at this point, I was pretty sure that uh, it had to do with the heat. I mean, I, you know, I was sort of like a you know, blind squirrel looking around, trying try to understand these things. And so I was thinking, like in the South, people obviously deal with this a lot more with, with, with heat, and how do they deal with it? Um, 
so I got in touch with some producers and we got on this, uh, there's a American Pastured Poultry Producers Association, it's called APA. If anyone wants to raise birds, meat birds or layers on pasture, it's such a good organization. They put on, a, I think 10 times a year, this little magazine called APA Grit. Um, it's just like farmers and it, it's a pretty low, low key um, newsletter. But then they have, for, they have a producer plus option, which costs 50 or 70 bucks a year, something like that. And you, you're on this listserv, which is just with farmers. And you can ask them questions. It's really awesome. So we got in contact with that. We started asking questions. And what we found out is like for when it's so in the, in the heat of the summer, the birds are all, they don't want to eat midday. They don't want to drink midday. They want to do first thing in the morning. Um, and so if you're out there at even eight in the morning, it looks like, oh yeah, there's some birds eating, some birds drinking. It's like, there's plenty of space on your feeders and waterers. But in the heat, middle of the summer, they, they want to get all of their feed nutrition in that cool part of the day. So they're all congregating around that early in the morning and the late evening. And if there's stress or competition, they're just going to have, you know, they may seem fine, but they're going to have uh, a lot, you know, there's, they're more stress and more, just more issues. So they're just not going to lay as well, essentially. Um, so what, what was going on, I learned, was like with a smaller flock, you know, we had, so we have these big pastured f feeders that say, you know, they, they hold 300 pounds. They say they, uh, you know, they're for 250 or 300 birds. And we had a couple of those out there. So seemingly plenty of space. However, it's really not enough space per like feeder and water space per bird. Um, so what we did is we, so this was 2017 this year, um, we increased the watering and bird feeder space to like three to five inches per bird. Well, three inches was sort of standard, but when it got really hot, although it never was that hot, it was like a medium hot summer this year, um, we, yeah, we increased it to like five inches per bird, um, which is a lot. Like if, if most of the time if you're out there, you have five inches of water or feeder space, you're like nobody's eating or drinking. It's, it's because they, it's, it's, that's a lot. It's basically it's enough for them to all eat or drink at once or pretty much. Um, and that made a huge difference for us. Um, and that's essentially what we're going to do going forward. Um, so it's not, we aren't going to shrink so my, my first thought was like, okay, if we want a thousand birds in a pasture, which is about what we have in the summer, we would have 10 small coops, which is how we do our, our broilers. But what we did, but it, it's just, it's very inefficient for, for as you scale up. So if we want we also wanted these larger flocks, they're more efficient for layers or for, uh, for like labor management. Um, so this is what we figured out is what we need to do. I don't know if I'm just talking like crazy if you guys. Yeah. Okay. So uh, another thing we did, we gave more shade, um, more protection from animals, from predators. Um, so our production rates were about 80%. Again, when, for our younger flocks that are at peat production, it's actually quite a bit higher than that. It's probably closer to 90%, but um, we, we have some older birds in there. So we, we have about half of our flock that is that we carry over for a little over a year of lay, which seems inefficient, but it's because we have such a high demand for, mark for eggs in the summer, and we don't have that much of demand in the winter. So we, so we try to have to figure out how to deal with that, and this is what we do. So the production is actually a little bit lower than it would seem like, and in the winter, actually, it's a little bit higher, and that's because the birds are in a little more, the, a little better production um, age is why. Cool. What we did is I, I found some old trailers, you know, at a garage sales or auctions or whatever. And basically I put tarps over them. I put like, like wooden slats that made them. They were just like a small old boat, tra boat trailer. And I put like 12 foot long two by 12s and put a few of them. And I just put giant tarps over them. And I would I attach that to the back of our movable trailers. And so it just like pulled around with it. And so there, there was nothing to that with their roosts or anything. And, it, and you know, I probably bought the trailer for $75 for one of them. And, you know, and the tarp was 20 bucks, so just like that. And really simple. Um, another thing we, I did, I experimented with a little bit. We're gonna do more this year. Let me actually get to like, well. So yeah, here's a good example. So what I did with this is I, I moved this out. Like I put like a, a, a ridge pole that went out farther and I attached um, just like some extra tarps that were like an awning sort of a thing. Which helped, you know. It, you know, in midday it helps quite a bit because you you've got, yeah. Um, so it wasn't like I extended the structure much, but I, uh, yeah, you just increase the shade area. And actually, it's it's, oh, it's protection from the sun, but actually more important for us is birds because we've got we've got two eagles that are always around, 
And then, um, yeah, that's our main issue in the, in the middle of the day is eagles. Uh, we do have owls that are an issue, um, and then skunks a little bit. But um, um, let me go back here a second. So um, yeah. So to me, what does pastured mean? To pastured, pastured means if, they're, if, they're, if they have constant access to grass. Um, yeah, moving them around. I mean, there's lots of ways people do it. But like, to me, this is free range. You've got a, you've got a permanent structure. You open the gate you know, in the morning or wherever. You leave it open. And the chickens can go wherever they want. Depending on how many birds you have, pretty soon, like as you can see, and this is pretty mild, anything within close range, you know, there's not going to be much grass, like vegetation, for them to eat. Um, and so what we do is we move them intensively on the pasture. Um, yeah, and that to me, that's that's pastured. Um, and in the winter, we don't have grass at all, so we change our labels and we just yeah we just say like we're non-GMO or local eggs. Um, yeah, so we don't want to confuse people with that, what that means. Um, okay, why do you want to pasture birds? Uh, we do, uh, so it's, it's definitely, I mean, the chickens can act like chickens out there. They're pecking and scratching around. You know, I think that's really important. Um, you know, healthier eggs, healthier farm. It's, for us, one of the main reasons we started, so I'm a vegetable farmer, that's what I am, and we got layers, one for the market, because we can sell eggs, people want that. Um, and we already have the market built in. I mean, it's because we have our, our customers that want these things. Um, it's really good for the soil. So we'll have, we rest about a quarter of our garden a year, um, like one of our plots, about a quarter of it. And so we'll put that in a cover crop that's good for the layers and we'll move that throughout the year. And so that's really helped us with our, uh, with our fertility and organic matter. It's a huge topic, cover crops. So we have, and part of our garden every year is uh, some stuff with black plastic, like plastic mulch. And it's always a, 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 tr a struggle for us what we do in between the rows. And so, something we learned a couple years ago is we'll, we plant, so when we put our black plastic out, we'll th sow really thick rye, an annual, which you would think, uh, you would think, oh, this isn't a great one, but it actually works great because it doesn't grow too high. It sort of shuts itself down in the heat, which is what we want. And then we under sow that with quite a bit of red clover. And so what the rye does, the rye will grow up a little bit and we'll mow it. And you don't really see much clover until until the spring or till later in the year, and then the next the next fall or the next spring, you know, if the plastic's gone, and suddenly we have these strips of raw or strips of red clover that were established the year before. And so what we've d done is the the garden that is that's coming out was the year it was the previous year was the one in black plastic mulch. We don't do a lot of plastic mulch, probably about an acre and a half out of the 10. I mean, maybe that's a lot out of the 10 acres is in plastic mulch. And so you'll have these strips, like maybe two, two and a half feet wide of, of pre-established red clover. Medium red clover is what we use. It just works for us. I mean, you could do other things as well. And then we'll, we'll go in there. We have a, a, like a, an old grain drill. And we'll, we'll go through with the grain drill and we'll plant like, well, we, we'd like to put a variety of things down. But basically, we, we, things that we can mow and that we can shut down but that aren't perennials because we're, we're not trying, in that area, that place, we're not trying to grow perennials. And so what we, so typically what we do, because so again, because we're organic, we don't put the chickens anywhere near the garden, anything on the garden that we're growing that year because of, like there's a 90, 120 day rule. So we only put the chickens where we have like a resting year for the garden. And then we also have lots of pasture. So when basically when they've run around that once or twice, or what we're trying to do, at some point we want to clip that down and put it into a fall cover crop that'll over cover, over winter for the next year. So basically we have them in the garden probably till early August or so. I mean it really depends. We got three different flocks, so we're moving them around. But other other times of year they're on pasture. Um, yeah, just something we have rolling hills where we have pigs and yeah meat birds and such. For example, we have this stuff. It's electric poultry fencing. It's, I think it's great. I think it's awesome. Um, it's about a dollar a foot if you buy it in like 160 foot rolls, which is typical what they, they sell it at. Um, we do two around, two uh, 160 foot lengths a time. And then what we'll, we'll do is move, we'll have an extra two we set up to, to like to make it a bigger thing, a bigger bubble we call them. And then we move it forward into that. And so, it just gives them time to move forward. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> we do farm tours and this is like, usually you can like point things out and it's much more clear. Um, and so what the fencing does is it keeps out land predators. And like, except for skunks, we've never had an issue with land, issue with land predators. Like I see coyotes, I see fox. As far as I know, I've never had an issue. We have aerial predators that are our issue. 
Um, and we've learned some things there if, if, um, if you want to talk about that. So the first thing we did for aerial predators, specifically for uh, eagles, is we put out these strings, which didn't seem to work. I thought, oh, you know, this will like confuse them. It didn't seem to work. Maybe I didn't put out enough. I don't know. And then, I, then someone actually probably got 10 people emailing me this NPR report last year. It came out some guy in Georgia who had the same issue. If you have chickens, you've probably heard it. Um, and he, they did the same thing, but with fishing line. And I think, and so we tried that and it seemed like it worked. Um, however, we tried it later in the summer and usually we have issues earlier in the year because by mid to late summer, the chickens get smart um, and they sort of learn. But early in the year, it's like we lose, you know, maybe a chicken a day. And so that's a big, that's a big issue for us. And just eagles, like we have hawks for some reason, the hawks never bother us. We have owls, which only come at night. And what we've done for that, um, we've moved, we're moving to, you can see some of these things, some of these other structures we've used. Um, sorry, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Our original structures were like this. And these are old boat trailers, just like the, the cheapest thing we could find. They're pretty low to the ground. And we're moving everything to these, uh, these ones that are higher off the ground. This is like running gear, it's called, or like uh, hay trailers. And they're just higher off the ground. And what it does is it, give, it gives, so that when the layers come in at night, I don't like to lock the layers up. And that, that would be one thing you could do, is, uh, is like go out there and lock them every night. Um, but, and then you gotta do it in the morning. Like I have these big, thing, these big holes they can go into. But if you do this, and we experimented one this year with, they have to like jump up high and they have, it's, they have like two or three gates that are, that are small for them to get in. And for the most part, so the owls are smart. The owls will jump in there and go in with the chickens. But if you make it harder for them, they don't. But skunks can as well. For a while, I thought we only had an owl problem. But I learned that actually skunks, when they, when they consume a bird, it looks just like an owl. Uh, basically, they eat their head and start to eat their shoulders. And the skunks are pretty good at getting under that netting. Um, is if the, the more often you use it and the hotter, the, like the more electricity that's running through that thing, the better. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. This is what a lot, this is sort of where it seems like the pastured industry is going to these guys. Um, more, this is basically how people use meat birds these days. Um, they're an enclosed structure. They move them every day. They're on skids. Um, these guys are being sold by three or four farms around the country. I've, I personally am probably going to stay away from them because it seems like what they do is they keep them in there the whole time. They're basically confined on pasture. I mean, there seems like there's plenty of space. I think this is recommended for like two or 300 birds. Um, and then yeah, they just move it forward. So they always have green grass, theoretically. But what you're going to do here is you're not going to have any predator problems. Um, and, but these are really expensive as well. And these are much cheaper and more, you know, you can basically build them with what you have on your, on your farm. Um, I don't know. Do we use the same type of structure in winter? No, I wish we could. We have a big barn. We have in the basement of the barn, you know, I mean, it gets 20 below sometimes and we've got this much snow on the ground. So essentially there's nothing we can do. We move them in. Well, when we have to, usually it's around Thanksgiving. Last year was a little bit earlier and like right now that they can, op they're opened up, like the barn is opened up so they can go outside, but it's not until most of that snow is gone to they actually go outside. Um, that's a struggle. But yeah, we essentially can't. But maybe it's possible down here. I know guys um, do keep these kind of things in the winter. They'll just close them up. So that would be an advantage for that, for us, for, for someone down here. But I don't think for us we could do that. So people who go to farmer's market, if you're selling vegetables, why don't you just have eggs too? Because everybody buys eggs. I feel like there's an, un especially in summer, there's an unlimited demand for eggs. Um, but it's an issue if you've got all these chickens, what are you gonna do with them in the winter? Because there's not so, such a demand. It's a, it's a real issue. You know, we've got wholesale contacts. We have a year round, essentially a year round, 42 week CSA. So we can deal with that in the, sun, in the winter, but we've, we're pretty established. But like these young, these, you know, younger farms who are only have hundred birds, it's more of an issue. Like in the winter, everybody's got eggs and they're not selling. Um, well, and that's a whole different problem, but it's something to think about if you want to have eggs, like what are you going to do with the eggs in the winter? Um, but so, but this is a buddy of mine, he wanted to, make something that he could pull around by hand. And he built this one and there's another picture I have on here. And it, this is the one we built and this essentially is on two, two bikes. <laughs> I built it on there. It was, it was a little too heavy and I tried to adjust it last year. I still wasn't very satisfied. Um, I, I could pull it around, 
but my workers couldn't. It was just too, it was, it was just too much. Um, so when one thing we did with this is we made the nest boxes and the roost two different uh, like vehicles, two different pods. Um, so that's a challenge to this day is uh, trying to find it. I have another picture somewhere of, sorry. Oh, right here. So this, this is what my friend did. That, the other one is his first attempt. This is his second attempt. This was like basically on four bikes, and this is their nest boxes, and this is their roosts. Um, and it worked a little better, and he managed no problem, but it's, yeah, they're still pretty heavy. You know, we always dealt with flat tires and everything. With the, with, yeah, with the truck and a tractor, it doesn't matter. You just pull it forward anyways, but in the bike, it's different. Um, the question was about how, how much acreage do you need, like, for a flock, or right? how much space. Um, so for us, when we have these two, these two fence lengths, so essentially 360 perimeter fence around there, which is like two, two fences, 320 perimeter. Um, maybe that's a quarter acre, I, I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what. If you have 100 birds, you could actually move that around quite a bit and that, you know, to always have them on grass. Um, so, but for with with a bigger flock with our 300 350 per like mm -hmm. per pod um, we we try to move those once a day we probably can move through an acre um, i don't know exactly my guess is about 2 weeks but you can move them around there several times um, you, you again like the goal is to always have them on grass and like how fast you move them is depending on your your situation like what what you're trying to accomplish if you're trying to fer fertilize then you want to like just boom, bump them forward just one at a time if you're trying to like move them around your pasture to always give them like as fresh grass as possible then it's a little different what you're trying to do um, there's other people who i mean and there's there's lots of again appa is awesome because people are trying this in lots of different ways there's one guy who has he moves his his uh his has houses to totally different parts of the farm every day. So they lock up at night and I guess in the middle of the day. So he doesn't use the perimeter fences. In my mind, that's crazy, but like it works for him, you know? And so, yeah, yeah there's, lot, there's lots of different ways to do it. In the summer or like in the later summer where we're actually on pasture, um, we move them a little slower. It's more like in, it's, it's, it's uh, permanent pasture. So there's plenty of grass growing. It's way more established. For the, for the clover and the, the rye grass or whatever, that's not rye grass, it's winter rye. Um, because it's, it's an annual, it's not, it's not as established, so they, they can make it seemingly bare ground much quicker. Um, but it'll, it bounces back, or at least the, the clover bounces back quite well. And my goal isn't to like develop pasture there, my goal is to keep cover and fertilize. Um, for, for we, typically what we do on that is I'll move the birds, the layers through there really quick, and then I'll mo put meat birds in there, which allow it, to, and those guys are in much smaller paddocks. And so it, it develop the, the clovers and the rye and whatever else is there will, will grow up around it and, and bounce back much quicker.